in this session we will look at the analysis of the poem first the themes of the poem death be not proud theme the powerlessness of death in this sonnet often referred to by its first line or as holy sonnet 10 the speaker directly addresses death seeking to divest it of its powers and emphasize that man though fated to die is more powerful than death itself the poem paints a picture of death as prideful vain even and works to deflate death's importance by arguing firstly that death is nothing more than a rest and secondly that following this rest comes the afterlife which contradicts death's aim of bringing about a final end with death's powerlessness proven by the end of the poem it is death itself not man who is going to die the speaker clearly argues against death being treated as something strong and important in a sense he reasons that nobody who dies is actually dead though death is personified as a boastful figure that proudly trades on its reputation as mighty and dreadful the speaker through logical argument aims to show death as petty and weak in order to build this picture of poor death as a pitiable figure the speaker directly confronts death insisting that nor yet canst thou kill me and quickly establishing the poem as a message of defiance death is then compared to sleep one of the most common place and beneficial of all human activities people generally feel good after sleep and rest the poem reasons so why shouldn't they feel good after death death is simply a rest for men's bones their physical selves while their souls move on to the afterlife having established death as nothing more than a restful passage between life on earth and the eternal life the speaker presents death's more fearful properties represented by images like the grim reaper as comically comically inaccurate one can read the speaker's declaration that death thou shall die as is assertion that this idea of death as something frightening and omnipotent will meet its end the speaker of the poem thus aims to flip death on its head its pride is misplaced because it is nothing for people to be afraid of the speaker achieves this by literally talking down to death making a mockery of its inflated idea of itself the poem also paints death as slave to earthly things further emphasizing death's powerlessness death is associated with fate chance kings desperate men poison war and sickness it is completely of the earth the speaker implies and depends upon earthly things for its existence death is not a master of anything then but a slave even as a form of rest death isn't at all that impressive indeed the speaker mentions poppy which is an opiate drug and charms meaning magics and spells as better means of obtaining rest thus whichever way death is looked at it is inferior to something else it is essentially irrelevant summed up by the speaker's question why swellest thou then the speaker asks death what it actually has to be prideful about overall the poem's present the poem presents death as having just one function to transition people between life and the afterlife with its fearsome power dispelled death itself can die 
death be not proud poetic devices and figurative language that are used in the poem first is apostrophe the definition of apostrophe is apostrophe is a figure of speech in which a speaker directly addresses someone or something that is not present or cannot respond in reality the entity being addressed can be an absent dead or imaginary person but it can also be an inanimate object like stars or the ocean an abstract idea like love or fate or a being such as a muse or god this poem is not just an argument against death but an argument with death to make this argument work the speaker employs apostrophe throughout the entire poem to directly address death as if it were a person essentially the speaker is trying to deflate the sense of death's power by tackling it head on the first word of line 1 uses apostrophe to make it absolutely clear to whom this poem is addressed apostrophe is also closely linked to another device which is personification and personification means it is a type of figurative speech in which non human things are described as having human attributes as in a sentence the rain poured down on the wedding guests indifferent to their plans describing the rain as indifferent is an example of personification because rain can't be indifferent nor can it feel any other human emotion however saying that the rain feels indifferently poetically emphasizes the cruel timing of the rain personification can help writers to create more vivid descriptions to make readers see the world in new ways and to more powerfully capture the human experience of the world since people really do often interpret the non-human entities of the world as having human traits the two combine that is apostrophe and personification they combine to make death seem like a prideful misguided individual who has got the completely wrong idea about their role in the lives of human kind in line 4's usage line 4's usage characterizes death as a pitiable figure apostrophe both opens and ends the poem the beginning lets the reader know that an argument directed at death is to follow the poem's ending death thou shall die tells the reader that the argument is finished and irrefutable the poem further foregrounds the use of apostrophe through capitalization lines 1 4 and 14 turn death small letters into death capital letters alliteration the poem imply employs alliteration quite subtly throughout and to varying effect in the first quatrain the numerous th sounds most of which are part of words that personify death conjure a sense of feebleness that the speaker uses to undermine death's power <clears throat> in line 6 the speaker suggests that death is nothing more than a than a more plentiful more pleasurable sleep alliteration backs this up with repeated m sounds creating a sense of abundance paradox arguably the entire poem is a kind of paradox in which death is treated as a figure that can be defeated by logical argument the main paradox though is that death can ever be defeated death is life's only certainty however the aim of the poem is to weigh death against the promise of the afterlife and it is in this context that death can be said to die the poem does not actually intend that that 
death shall be no more but that a certain idea of death is not worth worrying about that is death does not equal an ending <clears throat> paradoxically death is merely the birth of the afterlife this is posed most succinctly meaning briefly in the poem's ending death thou shalt die personification we saw the definition of personification earlier the speaker personifies death from the start of the poem all the way through to the end sonnets were often written as an address to a lover but dun subverts this by addressing death as if it were a person this enables the poem to argue with death as if it were arguing with an actual individual subject actual individual subject and to apply the same rules of logic that the rest of humanity follows the poem's personification is foregrounded throughout by two key elements firstly death is capitalized as if it were the name of a person the first death of line 14 is an exception because the speaker is talking about death in the abstract rather than at this point talking directly to death secondly the poem contains numerous uses of the thou and thy employing the old fashioned second person pronouns to consistently remind the reader that this is a poem targeted directly at death as though death is a being capable of understanding line 3 for instance po- posits that death can think personification allows the speaker to accuse death of being mistakenly prideful a human characteristic in line 1 and even a figure of sympathy in line 4 poor death that is death has such a misguided view of itself that it deserves to be pitied in line 9 death is personified as slavish rather than being the master over human kind line 12 returns to the idea of death as mistakenly prideful now that the poem has provided much of the evidence in the case against death <clears throat> the speaker asks it a direct question why swellest thou then the implication is that death like a person swollen with pride and that this pride is unjustified metaphor there is one principal example of metaphor in the poem meaning a direct comparison though arguably the personification throughout functions as a kind of metaphor too this comes in line 9 when death is characterized as a slave to fate this metaphor is intended to drive home the idea that death is powerless not mighty slaves have their agency taken away from them and the speaker of this poem is trying to do that to death through logical argument allusion the last line of the poem is thought to allude to the bible specifically book 1 of the corinthians 15 chapter 15 verse 26 which says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death like the biblical quote the poem has presented death as a kind of foe meaning enemy in need of defeating with the particular weapon here being logical argument the surrounding text of the biblical quote is about the growth of christ's reign which will vanquish all enemies until eventually taking on the only one left and that is death like the poem the biblical quote is about faith those who have faith goes the argument are in the process of defeating death and will be rewarded with eternal afterlife this is in keeping with the general content of dunn's holy sonnets in which the speaker grapples with questions of faith and how to be true to his religion <clears throat> 
form meeten rhyme scheme of death be not proud the form death be not proud is a sonnet and is specifically close to the petrarchan variety sonnets are a tight form that lend themselves well to arguments consisting of a proposition and a response this sonnet is grouped into two main sections the octave eight lines comprised of two quatrains and the sestet where the poem turns to offer its perspective on what has come before the turn in this poem is subtle as it is primarily an intensification of the argument against death as a powerful force this is a deliberate strategy that allows the argument to build increasing momentum towards the poem's concluding question of line 12 and the following two lines response the ending of the poem also represents a departure from the petrarchan sonnet in that dun writes a concluding couplet which is more in keeping with the shakespearean sonnet form this final couplet allows for a further shift in the poem this time to state as clearly as possible the reason why death is powerless the eternal afterlife the poem can thus be thought of both as an octave and a sestet and as three quatrains and a couplet meter the meter in death be not proud is iambic pentameter throughout with a few instances of variation modern readers might struggle to hear the iambic pentameter clearly because of changes in the way certain words are pronounced for example called in danzira would have been said with two syllables called line 5 gives an example of perfect iambic pentameter from rest and sleep which but thy pictures be the poem uses its steady meter to reinforce the argument that death is powerless for example the enjambment at the end of line 3 and the use of punctuation at the start of line 4 means that line 4 can be read die not here die would usually be a stressed word but the poem's manipulation of its meter forces the reader to emphasize the second word instead this of course foregrounds the poem's view that death is nothing more than the beginning of the afterlife rhyme scheme the rhyme scheme of the first eight lines that is the octave follows the pattern a b b a a b b a this is the typical scheme found in petrarchan sonnets but the sestet diverges from the petrarchan setup and rhymes c d d c e e in terms of rhyme then the poem can be divided into three quatrains two of which form this octave and an ending couplet the development towards the couplet at the end lends force to the conclusion which is making the bold claim that death itself will die because of the afterlife <clears throat> the speaker of the poem the speaker in death be not proud is anonymous though critics often take the holy sonnets to be an expression of john dunn's own struggles with his christian faith particularly as dunn had converted from catholicism to anglicanism a few years prior they are both forms of the christian religion however nothing in the poem definitively proves done to be the speaker in fact as the poem is essentially a logical battle with death it's reasonable to think of the speaker as representing humanity itself specifically the poem's speaker chastises death from a standpoint of certainty they believe in the eternal afterlife 
and for them this sole fact undoes everything that is usually terrifying or intimidating about the thought of death the speaker talks widely about the world and particularly humankind's role in it as opposed to deaths this supports the idea that the speaker positions himself as a kind of defender of humanity taking on death through a series of unfolding logical propositions but of course it is up to the reader to decide if the speaker's standpoint is convincing if the poem is worked through backwards all of the speaker's confidence and assertiveness is wholly reliant on their belief that following death comes the eternal afterlife the speaker takes the afterlife as a given taking the poem as much faith making the poem as much about faith as it is about death in turn then it is fair to say that the speaker is making an argument to the reader have faith and do not fear death the setting of the poem the setting of death be not proud is non specific in general the poem is set on earth as opposed to heaven which it gestures which it gestures towards it is a poem that makes its argument in broad strokes taking a look at death's role on earth and arguing against the fear of dying that said there are one or two moments that seem to tie the poem to the 17th century and to europe or possibly england more specifically the first eight lines give little away in terms of setting but lines 9 to 11 provide some interesting clues line 9 accuses death of being slave to kings referencing the role of monarchs in the doling out of death among subjects war was not uncommon at the time of the poem's writing in 1610 which was not long after the end of the anglo-spanish war from 1585 to 1604 this conflict as with many others was ultimately presided over by monarchs meaning kings likewise the religious turmoil in europe was also closely linked with its monarchies in line 11 poppy links the poem to 17th century europe as well the word is a euphemism for opium opium means afim hindi mein jisko afim kehte hain jo ek nashila padarth hota hai jo poppy phool se ke फल से निकलता है अ रेलिटिवली पॉपुलर ड्रग इन इंग्लैंड एट द टाइम द लिटरी एंड हिस्टोरिकल कॉन्टेक्सट ऑफ द पोएम लिटरी कॉन्टेक्सट जॉन डन इज जनरली ग्रुप्ड टूगेदर विद एंड्रू मार्वल जॉर्ज हर्बर्ट एंड अदर्स एज पार्ट ऑफ द मेटाफिजिकल पोइट्स एक्सक्यूज मी so though in truth he is a singular talent in the english canon this poem comes from the holy sonnet series a group of duns poems that mostly deals with issues of faith mortality and religious anxiety of those poems this is perhaps the most sure footed others present more of a challenge to god and worry about man's relationship to its maker but this was not always done subject as a younger man dun wrote marvelously constructed and extremely witty poems that tended to be more interested in love and sex than god and penance the early poems in fact all of dun's poems were not published widely during his lifetime <coughs> but circulated in small numbers amongst an exclusive group of people in the know the metaphysical poets was a description coined by the critic samuel johnson who saw in dun and his contemporaries a reliance on conceit 
which is in a sense an ingenious meaning a clever and a sustained metaphor means comparison and an emphasis on the spoken quality of their work in fact dun was often criticized by his contemporaries for not being stricter with his meter and form ben johnson quipped that dun deserved hanging for not keeping accents now dun is considered one of the foremost poets in the english language those qualities that made him seem inferior to some of his fellow poets and critics his linguistic his linguistic dexterity and his taste for the daringly imaginative are those that make him endure so strongly he remains widely influential and often quoted the 1999 play wit for example makes frequent inference to this particular poem bizarrely j robert oppenheimer named the first atomic test site trinity in reference to dun's sonnet 14 which famously begins batter my heart three percent god historical context this poem was written in 17th century england a time of considerable religious turmoil and the expansion of british reach across the globe dun was a catholic born during a time of great anti catholic sentiment in 1593 dun's brother henry was imprisoned for his catholicism and died soon after critics disagree as to the exact reasoning behind dun's decision but he subsequently changed his religious allegiance by converting to anglicanism later he became a cleric delivering passionate sermons in st paul's including one in which the phrase no man is an island originates the tension between the two different forms of christianity played on dun's question conscience and the holy sonnets portray an individual desperate for confirmation they have that they have chosen the right faith and that in turn they will be granted access to the afterlife with this we end the poem death be not proud thank you